Okay, so let's get started on chapter 5, part 2 on mood disorders and suicide. <coughs> so, first of all, we're talking about the bipolar side of mood disorders. So, we've got to talk about mania or manic episode as a part of that uh, possible diagnosis. A uh, manic episode or mania is a distinct period of time where someone feels extremely energetic, uh, needing less sleep. There can be impulse control issues. There can be impaired judgment issues. Uh, there can be a lot of acting out as far as just sexually acting out. There can be uh, substance abuse that happens that would not normally be done by this person when they're under the influence of a manic episode. Basically, a lot of what's going on with someone is very similar to what you would experience if you were on some kind of very strong stimulant like cocaine or meth. So, a lot of what's going on with these individuals is not substance abuse, but they will engage in substance abuse on top of what's already happening <coughs> in their brains as far as that heightened feeling of, you know, well-being. There can be euphoria that goes along with a manic episode as well. And one of the biggest misunderstandings that people have about what bipolar disorder is, is that it's mood swings. And that is absolutely not what bipolar disorder consists of. We are talking about periods of weeks where someone has elevated mood. We are talking about weeks or months where someone has depressed mood. You can have months of mania. There are people who have three months of manic episode going on, and that is by no means what you would call a moody person. That's someone who has that heightened elevated mood for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on end. So that's one of the biggest misunderstandings about bipolar disorder. And, you know, to have mania <coughs> is very akin to, again, like what you would experience if you were taking you know, drug, uh, recreational drugs that are stimulants. Uh, the same kinds of feelings of euphoria, well-being will happen for some people. There are people who have manic episodes or hypomanic episodes. Uh, hypomania is simply just below mania. The word hypo just means below. So it's not as severe as a full-blown manic episode, but hypomania can still be very problematic. But these are individuals who are experiencing all by themselves with no substance use involved a period of time for weeks on end where they have more energy where they feel maybe really euphoric but there can also be hostility there can be aggressiveness uh, a lot of it kind of just has to do with the person's personality at base or baseline and <coughs> for a lot of people uh, the impaired judgment is honestly one of the biggest issues because they can have this uh, feeling that they're unstoppable. They'll have feelings of being on top of the world. They'll have ideas that are really screwy, but they want to invest their life savings into some, frankly, kind of harebrained idea uh, for a lot of people. Can it end up getting into a lot of financial difficulties because of a manic episode. Uh, people will go and just blow money indiscriminately and buy all kinds of stuff that they don't need, uh, run up bills on their credit cards, just a whole lot of stuff that can, on, you know, on the surface, that's not, you know, life-threatening, but it's certainly lifestyle-threatening for people to engage in those kinds of things. So that's an additional issue that can come up fairly often with people who have manic episodes. <coughs> I used to work with a woman at Henderson who had just the hypomania. She was bipolar 2, and she was doing really well for, for years, and she decided to go off her meds, and she ran up like $8,000 worth of uh, uh, credit card bills in about a month just buying stupid crap for her house. So, I mean, again, the grand scheme of things that you could do to mess yourself up, that's not that bad. But, you know, she ended up buying a bunch of stuff she absolutely didn't need, didn't have use for, didn't want once she came out of her, you know, mania. <coughs> and then had to fight with trying to return all this stuff. And she still ended up eating it on a lot of the money. So she had, you know, probably about half of that that she had to pay back. 
and get her credit cards. You know, she ran up all her, a bunch of credit cards, uh, credit card debt, and you know, that's a relatively minor thing. There are people who, in the midst of a manic episode, will you know fly out to Vegas, gamble all their money away, gamble their house away sleep with anything that'll let them and apparently in Vegas that's a lot of things especially if you have money and you know come home and have lost their home you know have four different kinds of STDs and you know potentially ruin their relationship if they had one so there are a lot of things that people can get themselves into trouble when they have a manic episode now it's not like that for everyone certainly <coughs> hypomania <coughs> Hypomania, in particular, this milder form of mania, can actually be a time where people have a lot of energy, they get a lot of work done, they have a lot of creativity. There are quite a few creative people, if you look up celebrities with bipolar disorder, it's a pretty long list. And some of these folks can manage to get a quite a lot done if they're in a hypomanic state, and it not be the kind of disruptive chaos that you get as often with a man full-blown manic episode however that being said when you are treating someone with bipolar disorder one of the primary things that you want to do is to you know control the mania side of things at just as much as the depressive side of things if they are experiencing depression that's something else a lot of people may not be aware of you do not technically have to have depression to get a bipolar disorder diagnosis um, it is quite common for people to have those, you know, big ups and downs, uh, roller coaster type, well, more like, a, you know, big train ride going up over a mountain and into a valley type thing, but it is fairly common uh, for people to have bipolar. The requirements for a bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 diagnosis is just the manic side. To have ever experienced a full-blown manic episode for bipolar 1 and to ever experienced a hypomanic episode for bipolar 2. So the depression is not an absolute. It's common, but that's not an absolute. Now, I've had clients who had bipolar 2 that had hypomania, and the hypomania was something they looked forward to, and it helped them get through the depression that they experienced. And there were a couple of times where I actually had some discussions with psychiatrists that I work with about, hey, can we possibly just not have them on anti-manic medication because the hypomania is not that severe with them and, you know, try to make a case for it because I totally get why someone would look forward to having a hypomanic episode, to have a month of feeling just really good, really energetic, being able to get a lot of stuff done feeling really creative. I actually just had a client recently who was an artist and when she was going through her, her kind of hypomanic uh, stages or episodes, she painted, 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 got a lot of stuff done, did a lot of cool work and it helped her get through the times when she was really depressed. So for someone like that, do you really want to medicate that out of them? Well, not necessarily. The issue is when you've got someone who has hypomania, it could turn into a full-blown manic episode. So they need to be monitored. Anybody with bipolar disorder really ought to be seeing a therapist at least once a month just to kind of keep, you know, the, the windows of communication open. And oftentimes, if you've been working with somebody for a couple of years, you know just by their demeanor when they walk in your office, okay, they're in the midst of a hypomanic episode. Oh, they're heading down into the depression. Oh, they're heading up into the hypomania. And you can kind of monitor, and you might be able to help them, you know, get an appointment with the psychiatrist and tweak their medication a little bit here and there to kind of minimize the, uh, the severity of both their depression and their mania side of their bipolar disorder. So it is something that is somewhat manageable for a lot of people. And again, one of the biggest misunderstandings about bipolar disorder is that it's moodiness, and it's absolutely not moodiness. When you're talking about people that are moody, for one, you're not talking about bipolar. You're talking about probably like borderline personality disorders or a few childhood um, disorders. But people who have a lot of mood swings, 
we're not talking about mood swings over a day or a couple of days even. We're talking about someone having this really large pendulum that swings from you know, the depressed side or the normal side down up into the manic side. And it's a slow moving thing. It is not something that happens over hours or even days. Uh, so that's just, if you don't remember anything else from this, the police at least try to remember that. Cyclothymia is another type of milder form of a disorder, like dysthymia is the milder, longer lasting form of depression. Cyclothymia is the milder form of bipolar disorder. Uh, generally, you're talking about people with bipolar 2, technically, but it's not, their hypomania isn't even severe enough to be considered a hypomanic episode almost. I mean, there's a bit of a judgment call there that you make as a clinician uh, with those individuals, but someone who has hypomania that just gives them a lot of energy and it doesn't impair their judgment and it's not really messing up their lives in any significant way and in, in some ways it's actually making it better. That's not necessarily something you need to put a bipolar diagnosis for them. Uh, so again, it's just one of those things. <coughs> now I have not ever been a particularly like, you know, super hyper energetic person ever in my life ever since I hit puberty at least and it is a very interesting thing to have taken some of the medication I've taken over the years I had to take steroids uh, years ago because I had a nasty allergic reaction that was breaking out in hives for days on end and I ended up taking prednisone for I mean just one of the you know over the, the pill packs not even the shots and two days that I was on that I had, honest to God, like hypomania, I, I mean, I knew enough about it. At that point, I'd already gotten my uh, master's and everything, so I was like, holy crap, this is what it's like. I got like four hours of sleep, bounced out of bed, felt great, cleaned up my whole house, and I got a big old house, like 300 square, 3,000 square feet, built in the 30s, so there's dust, every, you know, always still working its way up from the wood floors, <laughs> I mean, just stuff like that. And I cleaned this whole damn house from top to bottom in a day in like six hours and I didn't feel tired I felt so good and I was like oh my god this is what they're talking about so it really I was kind of glad not that I was glad to get the hives but it gave me some personal understanding of what it must feel like to have a hypomanic episode on the good side of it because I you know I had two days the next day I woke up all full energy, I only slept like five hours, which I usually sleep like eight or nine to feel good. But the day after that, back to normal, back to my, you know, normal semi-lethargic self. But it gave me a lot of insight. So I was actually kind of glad of that, although I wasn't glad to have had the hives and all that because that was not fun. But uh, did get an idea of what that's like to experience that. So, you know, I have more empathy, more understanding, you know, real experience understanding why my clients would feel like they didn't want to take their medication and I can totally understand it I totally get it doesn't mean they shouldn't be taking their medication but I did I do at least understand why some of them really have a hard time wanting to uh, you know again if you have uh, manic episode where you've ended up in jail several times because of the crazy stuff you do when you're under the influence of your you know brain manufactured methamphetamines yeah that's probably not going to be a person that's going to be all that hard pressed to stay on their meds but if you've got someone who has the you know kind of milder hypomania and it's just a time where they feel really good and they have a lot of energy and they get a lot of stuff done yeah it is totally understandable now with someone who has a bipolar disorder rapid cycling is considered to be rapid cycling when it's four or more episodes a year not a month not a week a year so again this kind of hits the point home that we're talking about long periods of time for the ups and long periods of time for the downs of bipolar disorder it is not something that is you know a mood swing from you know one minute to the next I worked with people 
in the mid 2000s like in the you know mid 2000 noughts that sounds weird like like you know late around 2007 2008 2006 around in there that wanted to give oh, there was one woman of course I did not think much of her she was really not that great of a therapist uh, wanted to give a three-year-old a childhood bipolar diagnosis uh, no because oh she was all over the place in her mood and I remember just being like oh my god did you not pay any attention in psychopathology class three-year-olds are moody they have what we call fancily labile mood in the jargon it just means your moods all over the place my grandson's three and a half yeah his moods all over the place sometimes that's completely normal you also of course have to look at developmental norms for any disorder if you're talking about trying to apply something like this to a child that is highly 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 suspect when you're talking about you know a small child especially there are teenagers who absolutely have bipolar disorder and it's very very clear absolutely there are not a heck of a lot of little kids I mean there really is I've never ever read or seen any compelling evidence that it would be appropriate to diagnose a child under you know well certainly not school age, under school age but honestly you know middle elementary school at the very 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 earliest and even then I would be like, uh, about it because it's just, you know, it's not something, the typical, the more typical age for people to develop uh, bipolar disorder symptoms is late adolescence and early adulthood. Uh, so again, you're just not gonna see a whole lot of that kind of thing. Again, there are a few children who do have these things, but you know, a three-year-old who's just moody, hell no, that's not, not, absolutely not. Uh, what you would call a, a bipolar disorder and the rapid cycling means a few times a year not a few times a day so there's that uh, remission and relapse are two words that are used in a lot of medical stuff uh, in addition to psychological treatment but remission is just a time where you don't have symptoms or you don't have clinically significant symptoms a relapse is when you are having symptoms again um, when we're treating disorders what we're looking for is to get remission we're looking to get something that's not actively interfering with someone's ability to function when you have a relapse people talk about having a relapse for drug abuse a lot because well it's when you're using again uh, for uh, someone who has a bipolar disorder a relapse would be when you know they ha they've been on medication for you know a couple of years and it's been working well and then even though they're taking the medication they have another uh, manic episode or they have another really significant uh, depressive episode so that would be considered a relapse that happens it's part of it it's part of most psychological disorders there are ups and downs in life uh, when people go through highly stressful situations it can exacerbate or you know increase the likelihood that you're going to have uh, more symptoms for lots of different disorders so that's just something to kind of expect and again if you're seeing someone um, a, you know like a professional mental health uh, counselor therapist what have you at least once a month uh, if you have bipolar disorder a lot of this kind of stuff will at least be able to be managed um, with that regular contact you know if you get a therapist that you've been working with for a while they're going to know you you're going to know them you know and of course they can call you and all of that stuff with you um, if you've got clients that are that have been working with you for quite a while you know they can make an appointment if they feel like things are getting kind of out of out of hand and you know you make time to see them because it's important it's <laughs> really important uh, so you have that suicidal ideation y'all know what suicide is it's when someone kills themselves but suicidal ideation are either thoughts or fantasies of suicide and there is a wide range of what is considered suicidal ideation um, a suicidal ideation can be something as mild as just wishing you'd never been born kind of stuff that is very common for people who experience depression um, I think lots of people at some points in their life have been like man I wish I'd never been born because they're going through some crap you know some tough stuff is going on that is a very very different scenario 
than someone who has already bought the gun and the ammunition and written their notes to say goodbye and has have decided you know who uh, who's going to get their stuff yeah if you get someone who has that level of suicidal ideation you commit them to a hospital to get them stabilized so they don't kill themselves i have had a couple of intake situations where it became an involuntary hospitalization because the person had such suicidal ideation that i was f afraid for their lives so thankfully that's not a common thing but there's a suicidal ideation checklist i'll talk about that on on uh, on Wednesday this week uh, when I can share screen on some of this stuff but this is a big part of an intake interview if you've got someone uh, that you're doing an intake with and they have depression by all means you need to do a su suicidal ideation checklist with them uh, so that's you know an additional thing that you might do within that interview uh, there are lots of people who have suicidal ideation that is not severe enough to warrant further you know intervention and certainly not inpatient uh, intervention but there are certainly you know the occasional person that comes in that you're just going to be like oh boy this person is a danger to themselves I am literally afraid for them of their lives at this point uh, I've also had a couple of situations well more than a couple of situations where I got to near the end and I looked over their, you know, suicidal ideation checklist and their back depression inventory and just talked to them and went, I am honestly, I'm going to just, you know, say it, lay it out there. I'm worried that you are going to kill yourself and I would like you to voluntarily go to the hospital because I think you need to get, you know, some more, you know, s extensive help than could be offered to you inpatient. And I've had several people that went, yeah, I think you're right. Oh God, good. Because it's a lot easier to do somebody that's voluntary, deal with somebody who's voluntary in input than somebody who's not. Um, so, you know, there have been those situations as well. I would always though rather err on the side of caution for life in general. I mean, you know, we've been living with a lot of stuff that's <laughs> not, uh, the safest uh, over the last couple well year and a half now and I would much rather put somebody in the hospital for three days that didn't need to be in the hospital than miss someone who really did need to go to the hospital and didn't and then they end up killing themselves um, Robin Williams the actor uh, said and you know, it's ironic that he ended up dying by his own hand, but it was because of he, him having a Lewy body dementia issue, which I'll talk about in class later. But he talked about suicide. He struggled with depression his whole life. And he talked about suicide being this very permanent solution to life's temporary problems. And that is absolutely the case for most people who have suicidal ideation and, and or try to commit suicide. Um, you know the vast majority of problems that we have in life are temporary now not you know with the you know people who choose to take their own lives because they've got terminal illness and stuff notwithstanding because that's a different situation altogether but there are also people who engage in what's called non-suicidal self-injurious behavior or non-suicidal self-injury the more common term for that is cutting or being a cutter I don't care for that term, but I mean, I get where it comes from, but this is not a suicidal cry for help kind of thing. These are not behaviors that people are engaging in trying to kill themselves. They are <sighs> using really bad coping skills. Basically, people who cut themselves, people who hurt themselves are generally using physical pain to distract from their psychological pain. It's just a bad coping skill, honestly, for most of the people that I've, I've worked with. I've worked with quite a few people who, who cut themselves. Um, I've worked with a lot of teenage girls. Uh, well, that's a whole other that's a whole other thing. But it was a physical distraction from the psychological pain, or in some cases, much less common. It was a way of kind of making yourself feel a part of this reality. There were people who had kind of um, 
depersonalization, derealization, where they just didn't feel like they were fully in this reality, not psychotic level, but, you know, working towards that. And the physical pain would kind of snap them back into this, you know, the here and now in some weird way. Also, another really honestly problematic thing about this non-suicidal self-injurious behavior is it releases endorphins. You hurt yourself and you get an endorphin rush. You get those endogenous morphines. You get that feel-good rush uh, for, you know, pain relief. And for some people, it can become really addictive. I mean, there, I had kids that I worked with and I'd tell them, I mean, I would literally tell them, it's like, oh my gosh, can you not just go masturbate or something? Do something that's not hurting yourself. I have had a couple of friends over the years who enjoyed getting tattoos uh, and it was a form of not self-injurious behavior, but it was, you know, self-inflicted pain that they kind of, hold on, there was one woman, she said she straight up enjoyed the pain and I'm just like, okay, honey, <laughs> but I mean, she was an unusual person anyway, but the endorphin rush that she would get out of the tattooing process was something that she really dug. So, you know, it, it was kind of an equivalent to a runner's high for her. And th worse things, it's certainly, uh, you know, getting tattoos kind of habitually is certainly better than, you know, cutting yourself. So, I mean, at least you get a cool, p you know, cool piece of ink out of it. So, you know, I would not ever, you know, tell a client, oh, well, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, well, okay, I mean, how much room you got <laughs> to be able to do tattoos? And, you know, are you getting good ones? Uh, you know, that's part of it, too. You know, don't get tattoos on your face. It's, you know, unless you're Post Malone, it's hard to have a career and do that kind of stuff. So those kinds of issues also come into play. Um, no harm contracts. I will talk about a little bit on Wednesday, but just an overview. When you have a client who you know has some least mild to moderate suicidal ideation, but you're not worried about them, actually killing themselves you're just worried about them potentially hurting themselves in some way you can do what's called a no harm contract and that's basically a contract between you and your client where they agree to not hurt themselves between now and their next appointment with you which might be a week or two weeks and there is this agreement, they sign it, date it, you sign it, date it. There's a list of people and entities that they can call if they feel like they want to hurt themselves from your phone number to friends, family, uh, the on-call therapist, the, you know, suicide hotline, all of those kinds of things. And all of that's on the paper and you give them the original, they put it and you recommend that they either put it up on the refrigerator, put it up on their, you know, bathroom window, or bathroom window, bathroom mirror something someplace where it's prominent enough that they're not going to miss it or misplace it and that works surprisingly well even though that sounds kind of almost silly but it works surprisingly well for people because just having that strange accountability for somebody to that cares can make a lot of difference especially when you're talking about people who are really in the deep depths of depression Ironically, the deepest, darkest depths of depression is not typically when you have to worry about suicide. It's when people start feeling better and they get a little more energy. That's why antidepressants were getting a bad rap there for a while because after someone's been on antidepressant for just a couple of weeks, they might get just enough better to finally have the energy to kill themselves. When people are in the deepest, darkest depths of a depression, they just lay around and they don't even have the energy to do you know anything but once people start feeling a little bit better once they feel like 20 percent better that's when they actually can sometimes have the energy enough to actually you know try to kill themselves so it's a whole other thing but the no harm contracts can be you know useful and i have used those uh, with very good success on quite a few occasions so that's something else that we can do to kind of help with the with the you know suicidal ideation and suicide side of mood disorders because it is quite common for p for both you know depressed individuals and bipolar uh, disordered individuals it's just it's part of mood disorders that there's a much higher suicide risk so that is obviously something we want to you know address as much as possible to make sure that that's not going to happen so all right well that's all I've got for this lecture 
and uh, we will have class on Wednesday uh, as per usual. Uh, if you're watching this before uh, next week, uh, again, this is uh, today is uh, August 30th. So if you're watching this before next week, we don't have class on Monday because it's Labor Day. So don't come to class. <laughs> so cause, well, I mean, you can, but I'm not going to be there. So uh, have a good one and we'll see you later.